morning, everyone, and welcome to worship at St. Andrew Lutheran.
sins in the presence of God and one another. We'll take a moment of silence before we continue. God, our comforter, like lost sheep, we have gone astray. We gaze upon abundance and see scarcely. We turn our faces away from the injustice and oppression. We exploit the earth with our lack of need and greed. Free us from our sin, gracious God. Listen when we call out to you for help. Lead us by your love. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. By the gift of grace in Christ Jesus, God makes you righteous. Receive with glad hearts the forgiveness of all your sins. Amen. Please turn to page 140 in the front of your hymnals as we sing This is the Feast. your beautiful eyes as much as them as I can see.
glad you're here today. Thanks for coming. Um, morning to talk about the armor of God. Maybe some of you are happy about it. The German armor of God, right? Parts of the armor of God do you remember? Now, Luke? The belt of truth. The belt of truth. Mm -hmm. We put on our, um, no, the next thing is the breastplate of righteousness. Yep, yeah, right here. Um, and after that comes. Oh. Our shoes of. And then there's the shield of faith. And now we're going to talk about this. The sword. This is one of my favorite ones. I'm going to read from the Bible, though, so you get the whole. This is Ephesians chapter 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the power of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Stand firm then, the belt of truth buckled around your waist, the breastplate of righteousness in plate, the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace, and in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil. Of the spirit, which is the word of God. Okay, so the sword of the spirit. But the spirit. So you guess? Yes. Spirit, that's the Holy Spirit, that's part of the Trinity of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. That's what the Bible says. The Word of God is. You know what that is? <laughs> the Word of God is. Again, I'm trying to give you a clue. The Bible. There we go. The Bible. It's the Bible. The Bible. Is the one that the Holy Spirit helped all kinds of people write throughout the years. And it is the Word of God. Now, a sword can attack and defend yourself, right? Same is with the Bible, God's Word. We have to know it to use it. Now, the Word of God. Bible is precious to us because God speaks through his Holy Spirit in his word, the Bible, to tell us about himself, to tell us about his son Jesus, to tell us how much he loves us, and to tell us his promises. So when that enemy comes and tries to attack us spiritually with all kinds of things that are not true, God's word, the Bible, we can use that to attack him and defend ourselves. And this is what Jesus did when he was tempted in the desert. He used the Bible and God's own words to defeat his enemy. So, guys, it's important to read the Bible and to know what it says. That's why we need the Bible in church every Sunday. We have our readers come and read in Sunday school and H2H. You read the Bible and learn about what it says. And, you know, you can read your Bible at home, too. You don't have to just read it in church. You can read it every day if you want to. So then you'll get to know what God says and remember some of the verses. Do you know any verses in the Bible? I bet you do. You just don't know. How about it? God so loved the world. You know that one? And he gave his only son Jesus. Yeah. What? Yeah, you know that one. 
Dota. Yeah. There's another one that says, I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Dr. Jenna's been thinking about that. Making her baby and he made each one of you. So it's good. Pick out verses that are important to you. And then, if you need them, you'll be ready. Okay, let's pray. Dear God. Our first reading this morning is from the second chapter of the book of Genesis, beginning at the 18th verse. The Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper as his partner. So out of the ground, the Lord, Lord God formed every animal of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all cattle and to the birds of the air and to every animal of the field. But for the man, there was not found a helper as his partner. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh, and the rib of that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. This one shall be called woman, for out of man this one was taken. Therefore, a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and they became, become one flesh. The word of the Lord. We read Psalm 8 responsibly. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You whose glory is chanted above the heavens, out of the mouths of infants and children. I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars you set in your courses. Yet you have made them little less than divine, with glory and honor you crown them. All flocks and cattle even the wild beasts of the field. The birds of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatever passes along the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Our second reading is from the book of Hebrews, chapters 1 and 2. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, though through whom he was also created the world of worlds. 
He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for skins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to, the, to angels as the name he has inherited in most excellent than air theirs. Now God did not subject the coming world about which we were speaking to, speaking to angels, but someone has testified somewhere. What are human beings that you are mindful of them, or mortals that you care for them? You have made them for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned them with glory and honor, subjecting all things under their feet. Now, subjecting all things to them, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death, death for everyone. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through suffering. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. The word of the Lord. Please turn to page 142 and rise as we sing our gospel acclamation.
question. Have any of you here watched the NBC show, The Good Place? Got a couple of nods. I really highly recommend it. It's on Netflix, which I think more and more folks have access to. Um, but it's a really great show. It's really funny. It's really clean. Um, very, very funny. Ted Danson's in it, you know? Love him. So at one point in the show, the main characters are trying to figure out what it takes to get into the good place, right? What we might call heaven. And what would send you to the bad place, what we might call hell. And as it turns out, and this is a slight spoiler here, no one had gotten into the good place for 521 years. Yeah, that's years, 521 years. And this is because the metrics for measuring the goodness meant that every single personal choice a person made was impacted by the morality beyond the actual choice. So within the show and in our contemporary context, this means that every cell phone and piece of technology that we purchase and use, every food choice, every clothing choice, and living choice, job choice, everything, like literally everything we do would affect our good place score within this world. And because all of those choices are ultimately deeply and morally problematic because of our wild interconnectedness, everyone's points are so in the negative that no one had gone to the good place in a very long time. Now by the time the show's timeline had picked up on this, that problem had been resolved, but there was a lot trying to go on behind the scenes here. Once again, we have Jesus teaching, right? He had been teaching it re returned to the little children at the end of last week's gospel. And again, he is interrupted here by the Pharisees asking him some questions. Now, different folks interpret this differently. They might have been trying to trick him up, but also it was pretty common practice to ask a rabbi, which Jesus was treated as such, to ask them questions. That was pretty normal. So I'm kind of looking at this as like, a neutral question. Like, they're not trying to trip them up necessarily. They probably also don't mean, like, the best for, for this. And they want to know how Jesus interprets Moses' law about divorce. Now, it's important to remember that marriage in the ancient world was handled a lot differently than most of us experience it today. For thousands of years, and in many parts of the world today, Marriage has long been a way to forge alliances, consolidate wealth and power, to gain wealth and power, and above all, it was always political. It was never about love or desire or honor, respect, companionship. None of that mattered. It was all about trading people and focusing on procreation, and that was that. Now, within the Roman Empire, divorce was more easily attained, and it wasn't quite as socially stigmatizing. But within Judaism, divorce was a huge no-no because it means that, or meant that the family systems of procreation and continuation of the people of Israel had been interrupted, right? Israel was a small nation, and they had to grow. And so there had to be a really good reason for divorce. And the only reason that Moses gave to the people during their desert wanderings, um, and this was, you know, a command from God, and that was when infidelity occurred. And only then could divorce be granted. It would have carried huge social stigma, financial ramifications, familial ramifications, and was overall just not something people really wanted to pursue in the ancient world really sound too different from what it, that experience is like for those of us in our modern context. For those of us who have experienced divorce or gone through that with loved ones, we know just how deeply painful it is. 
Now my generational perception is that divorce, it, like there's way, way, way less stigma about divorce than there used to be. I know um, there continues to be that for those generations that are ahead of me, but for folks in my age group, it's not something you seek, but it happens and it's not considered a stigma. It's not considered a social family or a personal family. Um, but for those of you who have experienced divorce, only you can speak to the grief and the pain and maybe even the liberation that divorce brought you. And one of the things, if there's nothing else that you take away from this sermon today, I hope it will be this, that God loves you, that divorce does not negate your salvation, and it does not diminish your value as God's beloved creation. <laughs> And at first glance, it seems really straightforward. And then it morphs into this private teaching with the disciples who want more, right? They want more information about what he means. And he basically repeats what he had said before, but he adds on that both parties in an ancient marriage were impacted should they request the divorce. Quality for women in the ancient world, right? But what this all wraps up into, he is pulling it back to what he's been trying to teach the disciples and his apostles and us as he prepares them ahead of his death. So this divorce question seems like a non sequitur, and he wants to bring it back because it's all a part of the same equation, the same math of how to get into the good how does one enter the kingdom of heaven? What must we do to get to heaven? What good place point system is in place for us, so to speak? So he shifts the question from what is legally permissible and therefore justifiable to a radical demand for purity of heart. Well, isn't that just great, Jesus? You want perfection. A purity of heart that is unattainable for us humans. Like, even the best of the best, the most selfless, the most loving, the most accepting cannot be perfectly pure of heart. Maybe, maybe five years ago was the last time someone made it to the good place. Well, that would be at least the case if there were a TV show with this were a TV show with heavenly metrics based on baseball stats determination about who got into the good place. Because what Jesus is showing us, what he's showing us through these illustrations, through these questions, through this expounding on the law of Moses, is that in to enter the kingdom of heaven, the only thing that determines that is God. God and God alone determines who and who cannot enter the kingdom. Nothing is based on us. Nothing is based on what we can and cannot do, on what we can and cannot earn, because it isn't about us. It's hard to remember and even harder to admit. We really are extraordinarily egocentric creatures. And as we see this, like the disciples are so focused on this question of purity and purity of heart that they're turning away children from Jesus. Children, have they not been listening? Jesus has been telling them for, for us now for the past two weeks, let the little children come to me. Let them come. They belong here. They are welcome. And the disciples keep thinking they're doing the right thing. We want to focus on the teachings, Jesus. We want to focus on what your words are. But they're not paying attention to his actions. They're not paying attention to how he is living out those teachings. They thought they were doing the right thing by keeping seemingly unimportant and unnecessary people, people without power, 
away from their revered teacher. But in God's scorekeeping, who comes first? The children. The children come first. Those like children, the most vulnerable people in our population. Those who don't really have legal standing, who have to have advocates and parents and loved ones, and if they don't have that, the courts and state-sponsored advocates. Because these are the ones that Jesus prioritizes. It's hard for us adults to navigate that heaven and earthly command. Because what is humanly possible for us, that purity of heart, that coming before God like children, like the most vulnerable in the world, that is almost, and I would say pretty, pretty much impossible for us, but what is impossible for us is possible for God. Because how then are we to receive and enter the kingdom of God? Not as those who try to justify ourselves to look at the law and say, I am going to justify myself using God's word to justify my actions or to justify my behaviors. But we enter as those who accept God's grace. Like children who with purity of heart accept the grace of their parents. We cannot earn our way into heaven. We can only say yes to God's unlimited, unlimited, it is eternal, without beginning and without end, God's everlasting grace. We can only say yes to God's love. We can only say, yes, Lord, I am pure, Lord, make me pure as only you can be. not about what is permissible and justifiable, but it is about the God who justifies us, who redeems us, and us alone. We started with questions about morality and legality and what is permissible, and it comes down to God loves us, so seek God. Seek God in all we do. Seek God in all of our relationships. Seek God within our marriages. And if those marriages are not centered on God, then look to what God might be calling us to do. That is the equation. That is the good place map. God says, I love you. I choose you. You are mine. You are my beloved child. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are mine. It's that simple. You are mine, says the Lord. Thanks be to God.
confess our faith in trying God and words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of the Lord, who is conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffering under Pontius Pilate, crucified by our spirit. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come with him to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the union of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. May children and heirs of God's promise, we pray for the church, the world, and all in need. Holy One, you have raised up faithful leaders throughout history. How are those, how are those discerning of all the ministry, all seminarians, that they continue to be formed for the sake of the gospel? Lord, in your mercy. You have established a diverse and beautiful creation, revived the defining species, Preserve in ancient lands. Cultivate in us a sense of wonder for the world you created. Lord, in your mercy. You desire for us not to be alone and to live in community with one another. Strengthen relationships between nations and peoples. And we celebrate and support one human family. Lord, in your mercy. Share in our experiences and struggles. Bless all who live with any mental or physical disability. Inspire creative communities, spaces, and environments that are accessible and hospitable. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. You have established and nurtured relationships that extend beyond those gathered here today. Bless members who can no longer travel to worship with us and remind us of the continued role in this community of faith. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. We pray today also for Christine for healing from pain and for Mary as she seeks a long go. We promise eternal life to all your children. Thank you for the people of faith who have gone before us. Strengthen our trust in having you, Lord, in your mercy. Your honor. Yeah. Receive these prayers, O those in our hearts known only to you. Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. I invite you to share that sign of peace with one another, remembering to uh, honor folks of our roots.
out of abundance. He caused streams to break forth in the desert, and manna to rain from the heavens. Accept the gifts that have first given us. Unite them with the offering of our hearts to nourish the story of the love so dear. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, Almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opens to us the way of everlasting life. We remember that on the night when she was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took the bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then again, after supper, he took the cup, blessed it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and drink. This cup is the new covenant shed in my blood for you and all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. Remembering, therefore, his death, resurrection, and ascension, we await his coming in glory. Amen. Gathered together as one by the Holy Spirit, we pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but the rest of the evil. Let us the kingdom, the power, All who hunger and thirst come. The table is ready. I invite you to please be seated. We will continue with our one side at a time uh, community distribution. So just um, follow Debbie's lead. We have um, disposable communion cups, and there are baskets at the end of each of the first front rows for you to dispose of those cups. If you are not receiving communion today, but would like to receive a blessing, I ask that you just go ahead and cross your arms in front of you, and then I will ask you if you'd like to receive that blessing. All are welcome. All is ready at God's table.
body and blood of Christ, given and shed for you.